Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome to the exciting topic of Paul and women. I know that is um, a still, surprisingly, still in the 21st century, a hotly debated topic. And so I'll begin. Most of you have seen the flyers where my basic premise is that Paul's view is not quote-unquote consistent but contextual. I will have opportunity, ample opportunity to explain what I mean by that. But we begin by asking the question, what is it with Paul and women? What is it really with Paul and women that makes this issue still hardly debated today? I want to do that by briefly talking about the perspectives that are available nowadays that you will find most commonly um, out there. So I'm going to talk about some of the views about Paul and women that we have very common out there. And then after that, I'm going to talk about how I approach the topic. So first, I want to talk about four uh, main views that are out there. One is Christian feminism, egalitarian view, complementarian view, and biblical patriarchy view. Okay? Christian feminism is what is most commonly espoused by more progressive women, right? Who basically assume that um, Paul and Jesus' teaching abolish gender-specific roles in both church and, and marriage. Okay? So the common thing is patriarchy was very common in the first century period, but that the apocalyptic inbreaking in the event of Christ Jesus changed the way people relate to one another. That the event of Christ made a fundamental difference in how we live and how we relate to each other. And that also involves in the area of um, relationship, gender relationship. So most Christian feminism to, um, today, obviously you have what they do in terms of critiquing the chauvinistic superiority and abuses of women that have been common in churches all through history. And so it's, they basically argue that um, theologians, husbands, and some churches have misused Paul, misinterpreted Paul towards the submission of women. So have abused Paul in abusing, um, misreading Paul abused women. That is the general perspective. You have the egalitarian view, which basically also espouses the ideology that God created men and women equally to bear the divine image, the imago Dei. So both men and women are all called to embody and lift out the implication of what it means to be in Christ, to embody that image of Christ. And that men and women are free to exercise in the church, all the various gifts, which is true when we look at, we'll get to the biblical texts that are in question, that each time Paul talks about gifts, it's not gender specific, he talks about gifts and assumes that both men and women have this gift in Christ. So they move from that to say that um, both men and women are free to exercise this gift in the church and that um, the Men hold no unique leadership authorities roles simply because they are male. So this is the perspective of the egalitarian view. So no such thing such as male headship and no such thing such um, and such thing, the key aspect is mutual um, submission. That is the key when it comes to um, egal the egalitarian view. This is mostly espoused by um, Christians for Biblical Equality and most evangelical circles you find people that hold that view. Then we have another view, the complementation um, view, which basically, just like the egalitarian view, see both men and women as all called to embody or to, uh, to live out the implication of what it means to be in Christ, which means both men and women all are called to live in the image of God. So they see both called in that way. They were created men and women as equal 
However, what defines this perspective is that they do think that there are gender-defined roles between men and women. Okay? So men and women are called to, to complement each other. However, they um, women have specific roles and men have specific roles. So men and women are fully equal when it comes to personhood, dignity, and their value, but different in roles. The, the key passage that obviously is being used towards this is Ephesians um, 5. The irony, if you see the passage that I put up there is, most of, from this perspective, most of the time, the, this view begins by Ephesians 5.22 and not Ephesians 5.21, which calls for mutual submission. They moves on to talk about the submission of the wife towards the hu husband. So God has designed the man to be the father, provider, protector. He is the head of the family and lead the church family. And um, God designed woman to be wife, mother, not nurturer. She's active. She's called to the role of help you, the helper, helping the husband. So this is that, that third perspective. And you have biblical patriarchy. Again, it's like um, co the complementarian view, but it moves beyond that, right? It does acknowledge some that men and women are created in the image of God, but they do acknowledge that the man is the head and the woman is to submit. So there is some justification of bi biblical patriarchy. So there is still the subordination of women that is held, even though it is acknowledged that both men and women are created in the image of God. Yet the woman's defined role is to be subordinate to the husband. Okay, so those are the four main views. And biblical patriarchy also holds that the woman is created to be helper. Her role is in the home. She's supposed to be the good wife, like the Proverb 31 woman. So that's where she belongs, at home. That's where she exercises her authority, at home. Now, I want to sh move from these various views to what how I approach the text. What is become a problem is that most often when these various passages are um, isolated from their context and used to make statements about Paul, most often what is not taken into consideration is questions such as what is the theological context of this statement? What is the literary context of this statement? And what is the historical context of this statement? So that such statements are isolated from their context, all the various contexts, and used as proof proxy for both sides or of the argument. This is what I think is very dangerous. This is what I think has led to a lot of abuses in terms of violence against women. This is what I think is still going on today. Proof texting is a dangerous approach to biblical interpretation. Every text, there is no word have meaning without a context. Words make sense or statements make sense only within their specific context. And the approach I take also assumes that Paul is writing circumstantial letters these are occasion-driven responses that we find in the letters of Paul. By that we mean he doesn't sit up one day in his desk at some corner with his coffee drinking and say, hey, now let me write to that church about women. You know what? Sub wife, submit to your husband and everything. Paul addresses this church. He's a pastor. He is writing to this church because situations are called for him to respond. So they are mostly response letters. The problem is that we only hear one side of that conversation. It's just like a telephone conversation where you listen to one side of that story, you don't know the whole story. So Paul never makes a one-size-fits-all 
or gives a one-size-fits-all solution. The solutions are very contextual. This is very important, and we have to take, that's why it's important to ask questions in terms of what is Paul's overall theological perspective, what is the literary context that provokes Paul's response, what is the historical context that undergird the various statements about gender. So those are the assumptions I'm working with. From that assumptions, I want to look at specific passages. Again, please interrupt me whenever you want and ask questions or comment on anything. I just want to go very briefly through certain passages that has to gender specific passages, right? And so I want to begin, and I think it's the appropriate place to begin, is the Romans 16 passage. Where in Romans 16, Paul acknowledges multiple co-workers. He greets so many people. And in that um, greeting passage, there are so many women that Paul highlights. Right? One of them is Phoebe. And what Paul says about Phoebe is basically acknowledging, acknowledge, he acknowledges, acknowledges her role as a co-worker, a diaconos, which during this time has taken technical term and broadly, it's not just, diaconos means, or diaconia means service or servant. But Paul calls himself a diaconos, acknowledging that he's a servant of Jesus Christ. And at this during this time period, that term has been broadened to include both like table services, also ministry, mini different forms of ministry. Paul acknowledges Phoebe as a diaconos. And then he goes on to acknowledge Prisca and Aquilas as co-workers. Prisca and Aquilas also are those, if you remember, that Paul, um, in Acts chapter 18, they actually um, carefully taught Apollos <coughs> and brought him to the faith. One will say, well, that is personal teaching. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing, but still it's a ministry of teaching. Prisca and Aquilas both were people who exercise some form of service, leadership service. Then both of them, Paul highlights in 1 Corinthians 16 when he gives his greeting. He says, greet the church that meet in the house of Aquilas and Prisca and Aquilas. So he also acknowledges that as those who have church meeting in the house, they have some form of leadership role. Otherwise, Paul would not have highlighted Prisca and Aquila that much. We have another one, the contested woman that Paul calls Junior that Paul is going to call an apostolos, right? This is, Paul sends greeting to Andronicus and Junior, and he calls them apostles. Now, what has not been contested is the fact that whoever Paul is addressing is an apostle. The fact that this person is an apostle is not in question. What is contested is the gender of the person addressed. So in other words, if Paul had written and radicals and some male name, nobody would have ever asked the question. It's a problem because it's a woman. So people have spent so much ink, they've spilled so much ink trying to identify the gender of this woman. And people have tried in so many ways to change junior to juniors and make it a male name. It is not. It's a Latin feminine form. And there's no attestation that during that time such name was a man's name. And today there is more and more consensus in scholarship that Paul was addressing a woman. So Paul does acknowledge that junior is an apostle again this is where definition of terms is important. We have to distinguish two things. There is apostolos, which is a technical term for the 12, right? That is only used in the Gospels and in Acts. 
But when we talk apo apostoleo, simply means one who is sent. So these are people that are sent and entrusted with particular ministry. It's not apostle in the technical sense of one among the 12. There were just 12 apostles, that's it. They were never 13. Even Paul calls himself an apostle and is being debated. He's an apostle as the 12. Does he place himself as the 12? Again, that is a debated issue. But the term simply means someone sent. So Paul acknowledges that this um, junior is one who is sent for a particular ministry. And then we get to the Galatian passage, right? The Magna Carta of Christian um, fem, um, female liberation. Many people have used Galatians 3.16. I don't know if there's any woman in here who don't know Galatians 3.28. <laughs> Gal Galatians 3.28 should be known by everyone, right? In Christ, there's no longer Jew, no Gentile, male, no female. Again, this, this passage is so well known, and people have always said that Paul's perspective or statements about women should be read in light of Galatians 3.28. That Galatians 3.28 determined Paul's overall view about women, and the other ones are just interpretation of Galatians 3.28. But anyhow, in Galatians 3.28, again, truth be told that the text doesn't necessarily call for equality per se. If by equality we mean that there is no longer distinction, distinction doesn't, um, in terms of role, does not happen between a man and a woman. It says, it does acknowledge that in the eschatological community, your identity does not depend on your race, your gender, and the third one, your status as free or, or slave. That those things are indifferent, they call it in the jargon, a diaphorus. They don't mean, they don't determine who you are in Christ any longer. Because in Christ, those relationships, who you are is determined by who you are in Christ. Your membership in the body of Christ defines you. Your gender don't define you. Your race don't define you. Your social status do not define you. You are defined by belonging to Christ, being in the body of Christ. Does that mean that now he abolishes all forms of male, female, Jew, Gentile, slave, free? Of course, Paul is, Paul is not colorblind. So there's still race, the racial component going on there. Does he abolish gender hierarchy? Hmm, yes and no. Does he acknowledge that in Christ, those hierarchy does not, uh, does not, are not consequential? Yes, he does. So he makes bold statements. But again, Paul's purpose in Galatians is not to speak about gender issues. He is speaking about what has happened in Christ Jesus and how does that impact the way we relate in terms of race, gender, and social status. Then we move to the passage in, in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, again. 1 Corinthians is a letter <laughs> If you want to say that the most circumstantial letter of all Paul's letter is first, Corinth, first and second Corinthians. Paul has a laundry list of issues he's addressing in these letters. He moves from one issue to another. He is just having a laundry list of things that he needs to talk about. Within that laundry list of things, obviously it deals with the issue of gender. But what is key and crucial for Paul is understanding on the basis of what Paul gives those various injunctions. What are his assumptions? That is his theological assumptions. That's why Paul spends four chapters in 1 Corinthians. The first four chapters, he lays the foundation upon which he gives his ethical injunction. I want to know nothing but Christ and Christ crucified. What has happened in Christ Jesus has changed the, the whole course of history. What has happened in the event of the cross has completely redefined, reshaped 
how we live in the world, how we behave with one another, include gender relations. So for Paul, statements about gender are nonsensical to him without grounding it within this broad theological framework from which he speaks about those issues. It is, talk about gender, but talk about gender in Christ. Talk about gender through this broader framework of Christ and Christ crucified, which obviously is countercultural in terms of how Paul defined Christ and Christ crucified in chapter 1. What is wisdom becomes foolishness, foolishness becomes wisdom. So what is conventional becomes unconventional. So he's hugely countercultural in how he presents what God has done in the events of Christ Jesus. And that is the starting point for Paul theologizing about gender. The reversers, the multiple reversers that go on in the cross. And those reversers affect not only how you understand yourself theologically, but how you relate with one another. That for Paul is very important. And so within that broader framework of Christ crucified, and his assumption of the resurrected Christ who will come back again. That's why you have in, in 1 Corinthians, the cross begins it and the resurrection closes it. Right? There is this two pole. The crucified Christ is the resurrected Christ. And in the in-between, we are called to live that life of showing to the world by how we live that we belong to this new community, the new creation community that is created through the event of the cross and the resurrection. So that's the, the framework within which Paul's various statements about gender in 1 Corinthians need to be read. Within that framework, we have 1 Corinthians 7. That is the only passage that you have about marriage and sexuality, where Paul basically says something which is so might hurt our ethical sensibility today. Paul said the best way to live is to be celibate, right? Mar get married for the week, basically. <laughs> if, you, if you cannot be celibate, if you cannot live in renunciation, sexual renunciation, so get married. So all of you get married, you are basically weak. <laughs> because <laughs> ideally, ideally you should be celibate, right? But in essence, again, Paul has a laundry things of things to deal with in 1 Corinthians 7 in terms of gender relationship. But what is crucial in how Paul addresses that, those issues is that he does not give a one-size-fits-all solution to the issues that are raised even within the context of gender discourse. But what is highly countercultural is the way Paul thinks a man and a woman within the context of marriage need to relate to one another. There is the, if you want to call equality to its best, then you find it there. The woman's body does not belong to her, to her husband, the man's body does not belong to him, to, her, to his wife. In the Greco-Roman world, that was, wait a minute, what did you just say? Women's body were possessions of men, more generally, to say that a woman has ownership of the body of a man, that's huge. You are not just an object for the man's consumption, but that you have authority over the body of your husband, that is hugely countercultural. To say that within the context of marriage, a woman and a man should not withhold themselves from one another in a context that says, Get married, go have sex, yes, for procreation. Otherwise, don't have it. Paul, in that context, say a man and a woman should not withhold themselves from one another, but he never talks about procreation. That passage does not deal with procreation, but it deals with a lot of sex. He says the man and the woman should give each other. And even if you abstain for a brief time of prayer, come back quickly, lest one partner will burn. Okay. So you see there that Paul, there's some sort of mutuality created by this 
where he addresses the man and the woman in an equal way. But again, we should not misconstrue what he means by equality. It is not construed in the modern sense of the term, which means that if I do, do this, the man must do exactly the same, who must do equal same rules. That's not what he's talking about there. And again, in 1 Corinthians 7, again, this is a context where Paul says something about his eschatological or apocalyptic worldview where he says the time of the world is passing. Because of that, certain attitudes are well, are encouraged and others are dissuaded. For instance, being withholding from marriage and being celibate becomes an ideal. We don't know what is going on. People just say it's an apocalyptic view. Paul thought the end of the world was coming soon. It's imminent. People don't have time to marry. So everybody should be celibate. Yeah, that is one perspective. One thing he says because of the present distress, nobody knows what that present distress is. It might be apocalyptic, but it might be something else going on. It, contextually, that makes Paul to say what he says. But the contested passage is not 1 Corinthians 7. The contested passage is 1 Corinthians 14, right? And it's a passage that basically says that a woman should keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak but should be subordinate, as even the law says. If there's anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a man to speak in the church, for a woman to speak in the church. That is the contested passage, not 1 Corinthians 7. The problem with this passage is that just a few chapters before, chapter 11, Paul just assumed that women are called to prophesy in the churches. Paul just assumed that the various gifts, the way the gifts are used, the diversity of gifts are gifts that are given to both men and women. And that women are also called to exercise their various gifts. It is assumed. It's never questioned. Okay? Then you get to 1 Corinthians 14, which basically says, shut up, go home, ask your husbands. You know. So what is it that is going on? Okay, what is it is going, have you changed your mind, Paul? <laughs> you just said, I could prophesy, I have the various gift, I should exercise it with decorum, but at least I can exercise those gifts, and now you say I should shut up, go home, ask my husband. Different propositions have been put forward. People have said different things. People have said, well... The flow of that, those verses do not fit well with the overall context. Hence, the passage is an interpolation. Take it out. It has no place being there. Well, the thing is also that in some Greek manuscript, at least to grant some, there's, uh, there's some evidence too, in some Greek, Greek manuscript, those verses are placed in different places. They don't all occur in the same place. So it calls for some sort of suspicion. Right? Why, if it was really in that particular location, why is it not found in the same location in all manuscripts? So that is one thing. Regardless of whether it's an interpolation or not, it is found within our secret scripture. The people in the pew in the church will not say interpolation. That is nonsense to them. It is in my Bible. I read it. Please explain it to me. So the interpolation theory help biblical scholars, but it doesn't help the everyday Christian who ha has the Bible as a secret scripture, and they have to wrestle with those texts within it. Other theories that have been put forward is that, well, it's a, it's a kind of speaking that Paul is talking about, that it is not prophesying, it's a type of speaking that Paul is saying the woman should keep silent, the women are prohibited from a certain kind of speaking, not general speaking, because Paul assumes that they do speak when they prophesy. The thing is that Paul doesn't say in that text that a woman should not teach. Sometimes when people interpret that passage, they say that Paul prohibits all forms of leadership ministry. Paul doesn't say anything about teaching there. He says in terms of asking some type of questions. Now, other... Um, Perspective which is circulating now very commonly is people say, okay, Paul is just basically giving some sort of permissive imperative that 
Well, these women, they were so used by the cultural biases of their time that prohibit them to speak in assembly. They were not used to this newfound freedom in Christ that allows them to speak. So some of them didn't really know very well what to do. So what they had to do is ask Paul, hey, Paul, should we um, speak? Like, for instance, remember when Paul says when people prophesied, you have to discern and discriminate those prophecies. That is, you discern and judge whether they're authentic or not. So obviously, you have to ask questions about those prophecies. So some of these women say, hey, Paul, can we do that? And Paul said, no, don't do that. Again, permissive imperative argument is a difficult one. Other arguments are out there, but what I want to emphasize for me, theologically reading the text within its literary context, within its historical context, and within its theological context, is the fact that chapter 14, 12 through 14, Paul is talking about gifts, various forms of gifts, and how those diversity of gifts should be exercised. In chapter 12, you have more, Paul, the discourse that is directed to the community, saying when you have these various gifts, how you should exercise it. Chapter 14, he begins to talk about how others, the outsiders, view the church. And it's very important during this time period is, you can imagine, in, again, this, uh, the church then was household churches, which means that, like in Africa, you don't ring your child on the phone and say, can I, can I come visit you? That doesn't happen. You just go and visit, right? In this the Greco-Roman world, the way the house, houses were made, in such a way that people didn't pick up their telephone and call and say, hey, can I come see what you guys are doing in your church? No. It was open space. So any person can pass by and listen to what you're saying. So Paul was very concerned about decorum. He's like, it matters what outsiders think about you. So that's why he talks about tongues, speaking in tongues. Paul said, wow, it's great. Speaking in tongues is, is great. I am the best speaker of tongues. You know that. But what use is it for me in a public worship for to speak in tongues that are not intelligible unless someone interpret it? People who come by, listen to me speaking in tongues, say you are blah, blah, right? So he says, instead prophesy so that people who, who are passing by will be able to understand what you are saying and they will be edified. So in this sense, one could think, okay, Paul assumes that these various gifts are to be exercised by both genders. However, when it comes to people still have to be cognizant of the fact that outsiders who visit them care about what they do. And because Paul's perspective on gender was radical, to say the least, when it comes to prophesying and interpreting, the, interpreting or judging or discerning the authenticity of this prophecy, perhaps, perhaps, the women should not be asking too many questions for fear that outsiders who are not used to women having that public active role might be dissuaded or be offended. Again, remember, this is a contest, the Greco-Roman contest of the empire required that you maintain the Pax Romana. You have to keep the peace. Perhaps, again, perhaps, Paul was more concerned about outsiders who come to the churches. These house churches are not used to seeing the women having such active role, and he basically is saying them, Decorum is important. And maybe, maybe perhaps, the newfound freedom by some women led them to start speaking all the time. Maybe, who knows? But the problem is that it is not from the general theological context. This statement cannot be used as a statement that um, explains Paul's general perspective about women. There are too many other examples of Paul more progressive and embracing role of uh, women that to use 1 Corinthians 14 as the, the passage to use against Paul. At least that's how I read it. And um, Ephesians, again, I read Ephesians 
particularly beginning from Ephesians chapter 21, which calls for mutual submission. Again, it's problematic in that the mutual submission that Paul is talking about here still assumes that women are subordinate to the men. So we will have to deal with it as the passage which sometimes Paul, <laughs> I say he is contextual but not often consistent. However, when we read a deficient passage, you've got to begin from chapter 21, from <coughs> verse 21, which assumes mutual submission. This is a big time passage, which I was like, okay, should I deal with the Timothy passage? No, but that is where everybody goes to talk about women issues, right? I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. Um, she is to keep silent, basically. And then Paul, he moves on to say that a woman is safe through childbearing. Oh, hello, if you don't have a child, do you, do you have salvation is the question. The way I approach this particular passage, many different people have <laughs> different things, okay? So there are many ways people read this passage. I have my personal take on it, and I want to get your reaction to it. Again, I'm using my general framework of context, context, context. What is going on within the time when this um, Paul statement in 1 Timothy is being written? What has changed between the time Paul writes 1 Corinthians 7, where he basically encourages the majority of people, if you can, be celibate to a passage like this, which basically he says, women, you are saved through childbirth. What has happened between the time where Paul assumes that women are gifted with the all forms of gifts from the Holy Spirit and they can prophesy to the time when he's basically say, shut up, I permit no woman to speak. What has happened in that interim? What is going on contextually? Now, the way I read this passage might be a little bit unconventional <coughs> in the sense that personally, I do not think you can understand what Paul says in Timothy 2 without understanding other literature that was circulating the same time that the passage, the Timothy passage, from the same context that it emerged. These are literature that are not canonical literatures. They are called the apocryphals, but it's, they were very, very pervasive. They circulated very greatly in that time of Paul. It is important for us to at least listen to what some of these texts say in terms of gender issues and ask ourselves, is the Paul in Timothy reacting against those other very common views that are out there? Or what is it that prompted the statement we have in Timothy 2? And so I don't know how many of you know the um, apocryphal act of Paul and Tekla. Do, any of, do some of you know that? The, um, of course, the apocryphal act of Paul and Tekla. Okay, let me basically say, this is a story in general. This is a story about a woman who subverts all the rules possible in society. She was engaged to be married, very aristocratic woman. She was engaged to be married to a very wealthy man. She breaks her engagement. She listens to Paul preach first. And Paul's um, preaching was about sexual renunciation. So she sits on the corner of the window in her house. Paul comes to her city in Iconium. Paul preaches for three days. And the content of Paul's message was about sexual renunciation. She listens to Paul carefully as a good listener. She decides to break her engagement, leave her household, abandon her mother, abandon everybody, decide to go after Paul, to, to go with Paul, to go preach. In the interim, a lot of things happens to her. The mother gets angry, the fiance gets angry, they throw her into the den of lion. God saves her miraculously, 
But the story is that this is a woman who takes Paul's message of renunciation radically. So she breaks all social norms, does what is countercultural, takes this highly liberated perspective about women, and engages in a life of preaching where she thinks Paul empowers her to do. Okay. Along this, this, um, this act of Paul and Tecla, we have the pastoral epistles. And in the act of Paul and Tecla, basically, it says that a woman is saved through sexual renunciation. Okay? So it is by being celibate and abstaining from sexual intercourse that you are saved. Okay? So the question becomes, what happened to women who have kids? They are not saved since, since they cannot practice sexual renunciation. Okay? And then we have in a piece, it said, Blessed are the bodies and souls of virgin, for they are acceptable to God and shall not lose the reward of their virginity. So their virginity actually is what saves them. Okay? And then we have other passage where it says, um, Tecla baptizes herself. She puts on male clothes, so she cuts her hair short, put on ma male clothes, and go out to preach. Okay? Then, um, <coughs> when she meets Paul finally, Paul blesses her and sends her out to go and preach. So, um, this is, again, this is an apocryphal literature, which is very much, I think, it was fabricated. But one thing is important. It circulated like wildfire during the second, third, fourth century, such that Tekla was canonized as saint again. So she is known in that time period as Saint Tekla. Right? It never made it to the, our canon, but this was, it circulated like wildfire, and it led Tertullian, the church father, to be so angry and say that this is a bunch of fabrication by some pseudo apostle. Okay? What is important for us here is not the fact that it's canonical or non canonical. What is important for us is, that is the type of ideology that it contains. Right? The fact is, in the Act of Paul and Tecla, there are a lot of reference to 1 Corinthians 7. Remember that in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul preached the message of celibacy. If you are a woman in Paul's time and hear the message of celibacy, that is good news. So you mean I'm not defined by, my, by being married to a man? My identity is not defined through a man? You mean I'm free to choose not to marry and have children when people were dying through in childbirth? So you mean I'm free? To some women, this was a, it's good news. To be free from the pat patriarchal household is good news. So some of the women took this, the extreme. And from there emerges some, this type of literature that circulated, such that the time period that the pastoral epistle was written, that context had these two strands of Paul. Those who took Paul's 1 Corinthians 7 message to the radical extreme, and then you have a more conservative view now that is coming in the pastoral epistle, right? That now, again, the church is become, becoming an institutional church. It's no longer the house church as we know it, 1 Corinthians. It's becoming institutionalized. So you have a more conservative view such that in the pastoral epistle, a woman is saved through childbirth could be a counterstatement to a woman is saved through virginity. Okay? So if a woman in this literature is saved through sexual renunciation, in this other literature, the woman is saved through childbirth. If a woman should shut up and not speak nor teach, a woman here does not shut up. She leaves her fiancé. She goes out to preach. She is recognized and embraced by other women as a liberated woman and a model for liberation. So you have these trans that are all claiming to be from Paul, are all citing Paul, okay? So you have the pastoral, for me, that's the context within which historically what Paul says in, 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 in Timothy 2 
makes sense. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Because it, it's a, it contradicts completely everything we know about Paul. Besides, if Paul wants to tell Timothy, right, why would Paul even tell Timothy to tell that he permits no woman to teach, they should shut up, shut up keep quiet? Timothy was with Paul all the time. Didn't Timothy know that? Why would Paul want to reiterate that? Paul would not need to reiterate that to Timothy if that was his general perspective. Timothy would have known. He was co-worker with Paul. In most of Paul's letters, Paul says he's writing with Timothy. So Timothy at least would have known. Paul would not have had any need to write to Timothy and say, hey, you know what? I permit no woman to teach. So contextually, something must have been going on to prompt that response. And that response for me is context specific. So that's my perspective. And I welcome all forms of questions. Now, before that, there are three basic models of gender relationship that we see going on. <coughs> we have this model, which is a hierarchical Aristotelian household model where God, husband, wife, right? Hierarchy, patriarchal hierarchy. Then we have a second model, God, husband, wife, the equal sign, which speaks more about equality, right? But equality in mutuality too. Then you have that model, God, husband, wife, which is the, the efficiency model. Right? There is mutuality acknowledged, but still headship of man acknowledged. So this is the efficient model. <coughs> this is the model which says, no, headship not, is not because you are a male that you, are, you can have authority over a woman, unconditional authority over a woman. This model acknowledges headship. This one does not acknowledge headship. They do think that there's mutuality functional mutuality that is going on between a man and a woman. So these are the basic three models of relationship. And I want to really end this by saying, for me, the fundamental place to go when you talk about gender relationship, that is a frontal attack to any view of looking at a woman as not subordinate to a man is the resurrection story. Why would Jesus confide the good news about the resurrection to a woman. Amen. Why would Jesus do that? This is the fundamental story and the preaching about the cross of course, because this message went out. We have Christianity because these women were faithful. Either we talk about it as Mary Magdalene with the John passage, or we talk about the Markan or the synoptic perspective of three women. But we do have the good news about the resurrection that led Paul to preach the news about God's countercultural reshaping of history in the cross because a woman was confided or women were confided as the messengers. They preached. They were the one who preached or witness to this key crucial event. And that for me is the place to begin. And that for me, that place, you cannot deny that these women has been embraced. Her role has been redefined and a new mission has been confided her even within a context that is highly patriarchal, the resurrection story is the most countercultural story by God entrusting this wonderful good news to women. So <coughs> these are the women, according to the Synoptic Gospels. According to John, it's one woman. How can women not have a role, a leadership role, when they had the fundamental leadership role to speak about that event. So that is my 
One might have theories about one might have prompted Paul, other theories for Timothy. Well, the thing is that other biblical scholars do say that the church is in a different place, a different time, that requires the church to be more to take a more conservative um, perspective when it comes to gender role in order to keep the peace, in order to prevent the church. Again, because the church was, some, was tolerated, if not persecuted, so for, to protect themselves, they, they cannot or continually be that hugely countercultural. So they had to come back to that, some traditional household code, which is actually the household code that Paul used to talk about gender relationship is an uh, uh, Aristotelian model that every household in the Greco-Roman world used. So Paul would have tried to some sort of <coughs> cultural conformity because of the time and because of the situation of the church within the context. Well, Paul reads it through the cre new creation narrative. Remember, Paul is reading everything through God's apocalyptic in breaking the events of Christ Jesus. So Paul reshapes that whole story through the lens of what happened, that new creation that is formed in Christ. So Paul begins there. Yeah. And again, it's also contextually, celibacy was the ideal. <coughs> Every person, again, this is a, an honor-obsessed culture. That honor and shame were the two pervasive uh, values, and it is honorable for somebody to be able to control themselves sexually. Mm. So celibacy, if you were able to be the person who controls yourself sexually, hey, you are honorable, mm. right? Whereas shame when you are not able to control your passion, because you see sex as one form of passion. So if you are able to control your passion, then you become the strong man, the honorable man. This is really highly honor-obsessed culture. So that's why celibacy becomes an ideal too. That Paul, again, Paul's ultimate goal was not celibacy for the sake of celibacy, right? It's celibacy for the sake of undistraction, on, um, single-minded devotion to Christ. So Paul's goal is to create a community that lives in an undistr undistracted devotion to Christ, a single-minded, undivided attention to Christ. This is a type of community. Remember Corinth was a community that was so divided that tri Paul is trying to bring back unity. And so his goal was getting the community to focus on that which is essential, single-minded devotion to Christ. So it's not celibacy for the sake of the celibacy itself. Right, okay. One thing, my perspective on that Eve thing is, Eve at least was bold. The guy was there with Eve, yes. right? The guy was standing there. The Hebrew text said the guy, she took the apple and gave it to him. He was standing there. Why didn't he say something, <laughs> right? If he's... You know, the, the Hebrew text, when you read that passage, Eve was standing really there with Adam. When the, the serpent talks about, it, hey, apple, yeah, apple, she takes it and gives it to him, and he ate it. He says he ate it. Why didn't he say something? If really they want to use that against, I think that they, they're mutually responsible. But again, given the context and given what is going on in my reading, of these various other counter views about women, the liberated women. So they, are, they, need, they need to find a way to silence the women. And the only way, again, that is not only Timothy, the passage, Timothy passage that used Eve in, in history. They've always used Eve as the one that seduced um, Adam. And so Eve is responsible. The exegesis of that passage in Timothy is really hard to really fault Eve. Again, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul will use it somehow to talk about um, in terms of gender relations too. But I do not think that hermeneutically that it makes sense to use Eve. It doesn't make sense hermeneutically or from the perspective of interpretation. Because you have to first assume that Eve was at fault in Genesis to buy that argument. I don't buy it because I don't think Eve was at fault. They were mutually at fault. So you have to fault both of them to make sense of that passage. Yeah. Well, the time, the also one thing I think is important to know that the time of Jesus is different from the time of Paul. In the time of Paul, you are dealing now with a church that has become inclusive, right? Gentile Jews. But again, Paul takes 
pushes some of Jesus' statement in a radical direction, sometimes he backs off. And that's why we have this very complex view of Paul. I cannot exonerate Paul by just saying that, hey, he was trying to make sure that the, the church was not persecuted when it's not yet time, right? But there are certain times Paul is, takes the message of Christ to the, pushes the envelope. Sometimes he doesn't push the envelope. And sometimes you say, was it right? As a woman, sometimes I say, no, but hey, it's Paul, you know. But, <laughs> <coughs> yeah. But he pushes the envelope too. Again, we never know the full, the full story of what was going on, right? We know that when Paul can, every time he gets the chance, he pushes the envelope. When every time he gets the chance, he makes these hugely countercultural statements. At certain time, he backs off. <coughs> okay, so you constantly one have to ask, what is going on? Why is he backing off? Right. So he backs off sometimes, which is true. Yeah, I think that the, the, in terms of role in the church, or in terms of how we live as people who are in Christ, is the pers- what we should pursue is Paul's ultimate goal: live on in single-minded devotion to Christ. And if you do live in single-minded devotion to Christ, he, devotion to Christ is going to shape how you relate with one another. I think if we shift the focus in terms of what she can do, she cannot do, to the focus in how do I exemplify that life in this new creation and live this eschatological moment when I know that eschatologically who we are, gender, doesn't define us, race doesn't define us, our social status doesn't define us. If we live that eschatological hope in the year and now, a lot of things will change. Right. You know, this is something that um, personally too is very important to me. It's something that I hold dear in terms of when you see, okay, that for, sen- for a long time women have been oppressed, right? Women, are, all forms of violence have been done against women. I've experienced it myself from within my culture, that when I become, feel like I'm in this place where I'm liberated, right, that I stand in a place of power. How do I do? How do I, in, in terms of how I envision power, right? In, I think that is also important that while we critique the abuse of power by men, we have to be willing to critique the abuse of power by women, right? And so that model of, you see, this, there's this model when they say that uh, when Paul s- talks about the various forms of relationship and say God, Christ is submissive to God, right? And then he calls for various forms of submissiveness. It is not power to coerce, right? It's power that is in service, right? And if the goal is to serve, how beautiful be that be? If we focus on serving, right, a sac- sacrificial service, then there will be no problem about the power. Because you cannot eliminate people in, auto- in leadership position. Right? Even you have, there need to be a president. There need to be a vice president who is under the president. At APU, K is my boss. Right? So sh- I am under her. But the way she exercises power is, is as a servant. That's why Paul constantly, even Paul, he is the head of the church, but he constantly defines himself as a um, apostle, as he says, Paul, the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? And if everybody defines themselves as XSX, the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, and understand what service means, really then I think we will not have problems. But when the roles are reversed, women become in, uh, in place of power and use that power as a coercive power against men, that is a big no, right? We are trying to perpetrate what we are fighting against, right? So that is something that is important too, that if anybody in, in power position really exercise a form of the place of authority as a place of service, then we'll, we will not be talking about this. That is because power is, is also misused, even by women. Then is, what do you define by biblical inspiration? I believe in fallibility, not inerrancy. <coughs> right? Fallibility generally incru- um, assumes 
God will never fail. God's word will never fail. Does it mean that every detail of it is inherent? No. Right? But that overall God's project and God's vision through communicated through God's word is trustworthy. And it will still be trustworthy even if I think that the Genesis, the Paul's exegesis of the Genesis passage is wrong. I still wholeheartedly believe in um, the, the infallibility of scripture. It shapes my life. Right? It shapes my life. I hold it sacred. But by that, I don't mean that every single word of it, I have to agree for it to be infallible. God is infallible regardless of those exegetically problematic passages that we might agree or disagree with. You don't have to make every passage fit <laughs> in order to hold the, the, the um, biblical inspiration. Paul is theologically consistent, but when it comes to ethical injunction, he's not consistent. He can't be. These are circumstantial injunctions, right? That if Paul addresses a particular community that have a specific issue that requires a certain type of response, Paul will not use that same response to address another circumstantial or situational issue that warrants a different type of response, even if the subject is the same. It's just basically being a good pastor. You don't give a one-size-fits-all solution, <coughs> even if it's identical um, issues. You contextualize it. And may maybe in the, in the process of contextualizing the issue, it will lead you to certain dif different types of response. It's just like a parent who a two has two boys. They both ask him for candy. To one he gives, the other one he says no. And the one that to whom he says no, why did you give it to my brother? Well. Your brother may be needed if you don't, right? So sometimes Paul's injunctions are different, yet he's walking from the same theological core. It is that message of Christ and Christ crucified that shapes his general vision. But how that now becomes concrete depends on the situation. That's why he gives injunction about, for instance, 1 Corinthians 7, he talks about divorce, right? When he talks about couples who are both believers, he's hardcore. But when it comes to couple, a mixed couple, he changes his tone. So he's capable of addressing similar issues with different results. That does not mean that it's not relevant. It's still important, but it's contextual. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yes. There's still something to be learned there, of course. You cannot disregard it because it's in your scripture, right? <laughs> it's holy scripture for you, right? But I think that that's where we are also called to some sort of hermeneutically <laughs> appropriate those principles. What are the general principles Paul is enunciating? What are the general principles? How can I, in a different context, in hermeneutically reinterpret those principles without completely um, um, ignoring my own cultural context. You cannot ignore because the word of God becomes life and gives life to you, so you live a faithful Christian life today. For that to happen, you have to recontextualize God's word for it to, make to be applicable today. But it doesn't mean that you, you completely um, do away with passages because you think they're all contextual. They're not just all contextual. They're principles undergirding those contextual message that it's important to say what is the principle, the general principle that I can find here and how can I reapply that principle, recontextualize that principle in my own time so that I too, the ultimate goal, can live undivided devotion to Christ. That is the ultimate goal. You don't speak about gender for the sake of gender. How does it lead you to live a faithful Christian life? How do you live in undivided devotion today? Right? 
So it has to lead to that undivided devotion. How does this help me be faithful? That's the, ask the question. Not what does he say about gender so that I'm curious about what he says about gender. How does it help as a community, shape a community to be a community that lead faithfully to Christ? Um, it is true that the city of Corinth is particular, right, in terms of idol-worshipping city, right? There were uh, temples, all forms of temple everywhere, that there was that aspect of which particularity of the city of Corinth, right? But if, you, um, if the argument, again, the, the you are talking about the First Corinthians 14 passage, right? The First Corinthians, yes, you can see it in terms of well, he's talking about women who are coming out of that culture. That, but in the preceding injunctions that he gives about our women, he doesn't really talk about the issues about current. Paul tells them in chapter 6, 11, um, 9 through 11, he reminds them of who they were when they worship idols. And he says, you've been saved, you've been sanctified through the power of the Holy Spirit. Hence, it is because of this sanctified life, because you've been saved, that I'm speaking these things. So yes, Paul does remind them that you cannot do relationships within the Christian community in the same way as relationships were practiced outside there. But I don't see a redefining of the term submission there. It's the same word that is used both with Paul and outside Paul. Paul doesn't use a special vocabulary to make it different. Right? He might have given it a meaning that is different, but the vocabulary is still the same. The way you relate to a woman, let that be a testimony of how you view them. Right? You know, you change the world by just how you live. And if you have opportunity for more, uh, to get involved in social change, yes, but the way you live will testify to the change. Again, understanding that in Christ Jesus, something new has happened that changes the way you relate to one another, the change, changes the way you view the world, changes the way you live. Something radical has happened in the events of Christ that completely redefines, radically redefines the course of history and all the relationships. Once we know that, we don't just have it in as eschatological hope in the world to come. Finally, gender relations will not be a hot topic. But living it in the year and now, so that one day, gender relations is not even a topic because it's assumed. And not that we spend so much time talking about it because it's a problem. <laughs>